that whether they knew it or not, commonly it was accepted that these were inspired by God. So there's revelation and there is the human element in the Bible of the times in which these individuals were writing, the culture out of which they came or in which they were living, and uh, did, um, et cetera. <clears throat> Ultimately, the Word of God, we believe, is a person. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And so, the Lutheran approach to the Bible has been, this is the Word of God, and that Word is Jesus. And so the Bible, in the Old Testament, Luther said the Old Testament is the cradle in which you find the Christ, and the New Testament, of course, is the, uh, the story and the meaning of it. This one. So the word became flesh, dwelt among us, and God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. By the way, uh, when we get up, uh, when the scripture, the gospel is going to be read, you know, we stand, that's not just to get a stretch in so we can sit down for the balance of the sermon. <clears throat> We say, glory be to you, O Lord. It's a way of greeting Christ who's coming to us through the scriptures, through the gospel, the good news that's being read. And then when the reading is finished, praise be to you, O Christ. It's a way of greeting the Lord. So our lenses, our hermeneutics, if you will, with which we read the Bible are, should be, in my judgment, the gospel, that is the good news in Jesus Christ, and justification, are being justified by the grace of God in Christ. The Lutheran motto has been, grace alone, faith alone, the word alone. Those three. And that's what reflects this bottom. <clears throat> All right, any questions? <clears throat> any questions so far? <laughs> but how do you yeah. really know that one of these subjects are in that particular saying? Which, how would you determine that? If, if, if you were a delicate layman and you're trying to study the Bible, how would you know which one of these would apply? At least the uh, Word of God, maybe sometimes, and the Word. Is there a way that you know, one way or the other, that it's actually true? Uh, well, I would say. Uh, adult education classes, Bible classes, etc. If we start out saying, this is where we are, this is who we are, as Lutherans, this is basic Lutheran theology, uh, then our focus will, will be on Jesus, the life that he lived, the uh, <coughs> things that he said. Uh, and I think in, in, in the context of what we're talking about this morning, how Jesus treated other people. I think that was crucial for us to look at. So thanks. So how are we to understand then what the Bible says? Well, what I written here is what Christ says to the community of faith is discerned not by citing individual verses, nor by any one person, but by a communal discer discerning of the broader message of Jesus. Uh, we individually have the Bibles, have the scriptures. The reason for being involved in a Christian community is because that's where the interpretation stays on track. You can get off, you know, and, and a lot of the uh, non-Christian uh, sects that are around today are the result of one person who was in Bible study in a Christian setting but began to focus on one thing in the Bible whatever it may have been, might have been the Ten Commandments might have been something else but they focused on that one thing and that was the whole focus and they, they sort of drifted them out of the Christian church or left it deliberately and uh, some of them obviously have a following Mary Baker Eddy at Christian Science would be one of those. Uh, 
the Mormon church basically is comes out of that same thing. Somebody who started in Bible class and then began to emphasize one thing. Uh, Seventh Day Adventists, the same. They, their big emphasis was on the day of Sabbath in the Jewish religion. In fact, as a consequence, they're pretty much tied up with the Old Testament in the uh, Seventh Day Adventist Church. So what we were asking ourselves is, you know, remember that WWJD? What would Jesus do? That's an important uh, concept for us to bear in mind as we deal with this subject of human sexuality, hetero or homo. <clears throat> so the Christian church, as a consequence also then, has taken into consideration the human impact of some of the things the Bible says. And as a consequence, have turned away from those. For instance, slavery was abolished. Why? There are strong, you know, there's a lot of slavery in the Old Testament. And that's been argued uh, historically by Christian church bodies and individuals. You know, the Bible says, yes, you can have slaves. And others would say, no, it doesn't say that. What we do know is that was a very hurtful thing. It was unhelpful to society and to the people who were involved on either side of the issue. People who owned slaves and the slaves themselves. And so as a consequence, it was about, uh, when it was abolished, it was abolished because it was so hurtful to many. Or take the issue of divorce and remarriage. Clearly, Jesus rejects divorce. Clearly, Jesus rejects remarriage. It, we read that in the Gospel. But the Christian church decided communally, you know, you don't do this individually again, as I said, but we, we decide this communally that that was too damaging uh, in some people's lives, too hurtful uh, to be bound in that. So we recognize it's a failure in a relationship, but we, we no longer uh, impose. I could, you know, when, when I was growing up, when I was at the seminary even, if you broke an engagement, you were out. It had to do with this marriage, marriage divorce, remarriage, you know, relationship stuff. That's what it was about. And so uh, the church moved beyond that, said it's too destructive in human life to insist that you have to stay in a marriage that is destroying your life or your family's life, other individuals in the family. And so we moved beyond that. And now it's, uh, let's see, back in 1990, the ELCA came out with a, a social statement about human sexuality. And it was, uh, it was not well received by the church for the most part, but anyway, I remember I taught four Sunday morning class, classes in a row on uh, rights, R-I-T-E-S, versus, and rights, R-I-G-H-T-S. Uh, had to do with homosexuality, it had to do with you know, divorce, et cetera. So one person sitting in the class was a good friend who was Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod pastor, and he was an exec in the, in the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod. He was there all four Sundays. But he didn't say a word. So the last Sunday, I said to him, Ted, you haven't said a word. You got anything you'd like to say before we finish? This is our last day. Yes, he said. I think we gave it away on divorce. So why? Because it was so destructive hurtful in relationships and in human life. Uh, you know, Jesus has been interpreted uh, in the New Testament, in the Gospel, uh, as being anti-Judaism. And he, he had a lot of things to say to the leaders of Judaism of, of his day, the synagogue, etc. The 
con the consequence of that was it led to anti-Semitism. And so we had some terrible things happening all through history from the time of Jesus on. By people, uh, with regard to Jewish people in particular, because some people interpret the New Testament to say that Jesus was anti-Judaism, and therefore we should be also. Terrible consequences in history and in the world as a consequence. And it is why stigmatizing homosexual persons, which profoundly hurts individuals, and I think society, is therefore contrary to the word of God, is as discovered, discerned in Christ's gospel. Stigmatizing homosexual persons is contrary to the word of God. It's profoundly hurtful. It is not the way Jesus dealt with people. And if we go with today's scientific understanding about homosexuality, uh, it, it, in addition to uh, what the, where we are with the scriptures, uh, we'll be in good shape. So then we come to, that's all kind of background for hermeneutic. Then we come to the exegesis, which is really, what are the meaning of the original words, uh, all of our, as I said, our translations? What was the cultural context in which it was written? What was the uh, historical context of that particular passage? And this is what a pastor does in preparing a sermon, for instance. You, you dig, delve into all of this. You, if you can, you can try to read the original language. I can't do that. <clears throat> so let's look at the six big passages, as I call them. And the first one you're going to find on page four in the front. Genesis 19. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. He said, Please, my lords, turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night, and wash your feet, and then you can rise early and go on your way. They said, no, we will spend the night in the square. But he urged them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man, surrounded his house. Go on, please, a little farther. Okay. <clears throat> And they called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we may know them. Lot went out of the door. In some uh, uh, scriptures, that's translated as so we may rape them. That's what it means. You know, the biblical sense of, of no sexual is no. Yeah, go ahead. So Lot went out of the door to the men and shut the door after him and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Look, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Let me bring them out to you, and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. Okay, we can stop there. We get the idea. Uh, here come, well, it says they're, they're angels. They're two strangers who come into the community.